some notes out here. The first thing I want to do is look at some biomes. I said first we'll talk about regions. And the term biomes is used to describe the physical variety of the world. And it's typically divided into desert areas, grassland, forests, temperate and tropical, with very different trees, and typically very different cultures, different food systems. Rainforest, also different cultures. Tega, this is uh, the tall uh, forests built over permafrost. Uh, and tundra, tundra is a treeless desert of snow, typically seen around the Arctic Circle. Um, which biomes are the most common? It's pretty even, all around the world, right? Each, except for scrub there, scrub is a tiny percentage. But, you know, if you think of the differences in temperature, precipitation, and altitude, and just with those three variables, you can analyze the whole world. Now, here is rising temperature, so you have this temperature area for savannah, and this low rainfall. But as you get higher rainfall with the same temperature, you have a dry forest, and even more rain, you get a tropical evergreen forest. And think about these as countries in a way. Like certain cultures develop connected to particular areas. And it's based a lot on the material world of these three variables. Because biotype is dependent upon temperature and precipitation, we find patterns of biomes at different latitudes too. So even within the same country, you have maybe a high latitude cloud forest and a different culture in the mountains and a very different culture in the lowlands below. And thus we end up with a distribution of biomes across the world. And here's a map of different ecological cultures. That's one way of organizing it. Another way people have developed since the 1970s are called ecoregions, uh, ecoregions of the world. This is a map, and each tiny area is a special ecoregion. If you notice this previous map, where is it? This previous map has larger areas, but this actually has much smaller areas. Each one of these represents a different soil, climate type, precipitation, and these are the real boundaries of the world. So this is a big macro theory idea. Um, it previously was at National Geographic Society, but they, they removed that wonderful website, so I'm glad I saved a lot of this data. Notice there's different ecoregions of the ocean, too. So the world is not just a blank area, but has many different uh, cultural potentialities. And I made a chart here to show that you know, within Antarctica, you only have four kinds of tundra. Within uh, neotropic areas, you have lots of varieties. So some areas have lots of different categories some areas of the world, and some are more purist. So ecoregions, as I said, you know, here's the fact of that, you know, biomes and ecoregions are terms we can start with. Let's go back to Navon now. I will just some, quickly summarize this. This book is called Why Some Like It Hot? Food, Genes, and Cultural Diversity. He argues that because of all this geographic variety, that humans are not an abstract species. We're a very regional species. That our food, our culture, is linked to particular areas over time. And if we leave that culture, we may leave that region, we may get very sick. In fact, the global food systems that we live under now have a huge amount of dietary-based problems. And a lot of people when they leave their regional, historical, traditional food, they get sick. And when they go back to their regional, traditional food, they get well. And he says, it's because over time, our genetics have adapted to the environment. 
of a region and our cultural choices for food. It's a fascinating book that we don't have time much to talk about. And so on top of this, let's add a wider territorial organization, as I said. Carniera, the term is environmental circumscription. And let's look at Carniera here. He says Carniera has a theory of the origin of the state connected to the environment. And this actually uh, was published in 1970. Theory of the origin of the state. It's a very short article, seven pages, but interesting for environmental sociology. It says, for the first two million years of existence, man lived in bands or villages, which, as far as we can tell, were completely autonomous. That's the regional environment. Until 1850, as Bodley argues, we were mostly a regional cultural world, not a territorial state culture world. Uh, so villages beginning around 5000 BC or BCE, more stratification developing as we domesticated food, domesticated animals, and some areas had more animals than others, and it allowed people to become more hierarchical. That is Jared Diamond's idea. It says in the middle of this page, Explicit theories of the state, theories of the origin of the state are relatively modern. Classical writers like Aristotle, unfamiliar with other forms of political organization, tended to think the state as natural. It's not. Half the world did not live in a territorial state in 1850. And therefore, he, Aristotle didn't think we need an explanation. But as people grew to know more about anthropology and the huge amount of people that did not live in states. We needed the theory of how states developed. It says, however, the age of exploration, by making Europeans aware that many people throughout the world live, not in states, but in independent villages or tribes, in particular ecological regions, made the state seem less natural, more in need of an explanation. Um, to summarize what he says, he says there's two general trends. One are for voluntaristic theories, that people choose to make a state. That it's a voluntary thing, that people adopt the leadership over multiple regions. He disagrees with the voluntaristic view, and he has a coercive view of the state. But it's not simply war that makes the state, he says. It's war in a particular environmental context. He says, war by itself historically never create states. There's lots of small wars always between many regional groups. Something else plus war created the state. And that additional issue is, he says, the environmental context. He says, thus while warfare may be a necessary condition for the rise of the state, is not a sufficient one. Or to put it another way, while we can identify war as the mechanism of state formation, we need to specify the conditions under which it gave rise to the state. Because war, by itself, did not create states, he said. And his analysis of global history and macro theory here is called environmental circumscription. He says, how are we to determine these conditions? One promising approach is to look for factors common to areas of the world in which states arose indigenously, you know, states by themselves, states that didn't only depend on war. And like Egypt or Mesopotamia, the Tigris Euphrates, the Valley of Mexico, or valleys of Peru in the New World, like the Incan Empire. And I will, to save time, concentrate on the Incan Empire example he gives. He says all of these indigenous states are, you know, they differ from one another in many ways. Altitude, temperature, rainfall. So not a, there's no particular environment that makes a state. It's a particular closed area that makes a state, he says. They do, however, have one thing in common. They are all areas of circumscribed agricultural land. You know that term, circumscribed, means closed. You reach a boundary and you cannot go any further. In South America, there are lots of valleys 
battles against the Pacific Ocean. And for thousands of years, people developed small local you know, tribal units within these battles. And only when they reached the boundaries of this, they began to fight. So he says they always fought, but they did not fight and created a huge hierarchy until uh, the environmental context forced them. Moving on, he says, but what is the significance of circumscribed agricultural land for the origin of the state? Its significance can be best understood by comparing the political development of two regions, having contrasting ecologies, one a region with circumscribed agricultural land, and the other where there was unlimited land. He says, if there's unlimited land, there's no reason that war will make a state. But if there's a limited environment, there is a lot of evidence that war will make a state. This is a huge debate on the origin of surplus. You probably uh, heard this in some people's analysis of the origin of states, that some people argued that, uh, that economic surplus was created by agriculture. He says, no, agriculture did not create a surplus because agriculture had existed for thousands of years without doing that. It was always a small thing, agriculture. Agriculture only started to create an economic surplus within a particular state-centric agriculture, where when you conquered someone, they couldn't leave. So you force them to produce more than they needed. And he says, the state created the economic surplus. Our culture did not create the economic surplus. But political pressure forced people through taxation and slavery to begin to build huge amounts of wealth for an elite. So this is the debate between our culture creating economic surplus, or Carnera argues the state is the origin of economic surplus, the conflicts creating the state. And I think that's all we need to, to talk about right there.